Welcome everyone. So, let us start with another example of a Nash equilibrium. Uh, let us look at a non cooperative game of the following kind. So, there is a block here on the on a horizontal uh, surface and there are two players and the players are exerting a unit force on that block. What the players have to choose is the direction in which they will pull the block. Okay, so, player 2 is here, this is say player 2, we are going to measure his direction uh, by an angle, let us call this angle u2, this is player 2 and likewise player 1 is measuring, is pulling say in this direction, let us call this angle u1 for player 1. Now, uh, the position of the block will now change now that they are exerting this force on this. So, the equations of motion that we have for the block is that if you like, let us take this as the x 1 axis, let us take this as the x 2 axis. So, x 1 double dot will now be the which is uh, the acceleration along the x 1 direction is going to be since these are unit forces you are you can just take this as this is actually just cos of u 1 plus uh, cos of u 2. Likewise, x 2 double dot is going to be sin of u 1 plus sin of u 2 right. and I will give you a initial conditions also the the block the block starts at rest. So, x 1 of 0 is equal to x 2 of 0 and let us take that point at as the origin and x 1 dot of of 0 is also equal to x 2 dot of 0 and that is also equal to 0. So, it starts at rest at the origin and then these players exert these forces all right. Now, there is an assumption here which uh, which I need to make and I need to emphasize which is that these players are going to decide the angles at which they will pull, but then the angles once decided will remain fixed ok. The angles will not change with time although the block moves with time over time the angles once decided are going to remain fixed all right so so u1 u2 once decided are held fixed this is the assumption all right now, what are the what are the objectives of the players? The pl these players want to uh, have the following objectives. Player one, player one, wh what he wants to do is wants to minimize this value. The this is x one, which is the x one position of the of the block at time one, x one of one. Okay, so the position along the x one axis at time one is what he wants to minimize. So, he wants to choose his u 1 to uh, to minimize that. Player 2 wants to minimize x 2 of 1, x 2 of 1 is then the position along the x 2 the vertical axis here all right. So, you can see basically the goal player 1 essentially uh, wants to uh, player 1 wants to pull the block in this direction effectively that is where his uh, that is his attempt player 2 wants to pull the block in this direction right. Now, uh, obviously, if player 1 was the only player in this picture he would he would put all his force along this this particular axis and that would uh, uh, that is uh, uh, then that is what uh, would get and the block would end up at uh, at a unit distance in time one. Okay, actually at distance I think half at time one. All right, and uh, at, at 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 so you would get x one equal to minus <coughs> half here. And likewise, if player two was the only player in the picture, then he would just pull completely along this direction, and you would get x two of one equal to minus half as well. Now, what we want to know now is what given that this is now if these two players are engaged in this kind of a situation in a non and in a non and they have to choose their u1 and u2 in a non cooperative fashion what what is the way to solve this problem and what is the the what, what should be the solution we should be uh, by which we should be analyzing this problem right so 
this is again we are going to assume this to be a non cooperative setting. So, players are uh, will not communicate with each other and they will each want to uh, choose their action with uh, to maximize their own uh, payoff or minimize in this case their own co the coordinate that they are interested in. So, considering this then we should be solving for the Nash equilibrium of this case. So, what we need to look for a Nash equilibrium. u1 u2 or let us call this u1 star u2 star ok. So, now uh, can someone tell me what would be the Nash equilibrium? Hmm. So, so p1 pulls against minus x1. So, so u1 you know yeah. So, uh, p1 pulls towards the direction minus x1 that means it, you can check this that u1 equal to basically <laughs> u1 equal to pi and likewise u2 equal to minus pi by 2, u1 star equal to pi and u2 star equal to minus pi by 2 is an Nash equilibrium. Now, can you tell me where does the block end up in this situation? Yeah, so the, the where does the block end up? The block ends up, so this is where, so u1 is this pi u2 is minus pi by 2 or in short this is u2 minus u1 star u2 star and you can check that what the a the block will end up at at minus half comma half minus half ok. Now, what is interesting about this? The interesting thing is, so what the see the block has basically moved in now as a result in this particular direction. Okay. Now, what is interesting about this is that if you see, if these players were to, in fact, instead of doing this, were they instead to choose the directions in which each pulled along the 45 degree line in this along in the in the, in the third quadrant? That means, if you if they had instead chosen say u1 bar equal to u2 bar equal to minus 5 pi by 4, then what would happen? Then the block would go along this direction, but even further down because both the forces would be aligned, right. So, they would actually each be better off, but because this is a non-cooperative situation, each player is basically optimizing his own payoff, assuming the others, uh, assuming the other uh, payoff as fixed. So consequently, player one does not uh, cannot guarantee that the other player is also going to play along this particular direction. What happens is each, uh, essentially that as a result, each player basically pulls along their own respective axis. Okay. So now you can. See, uh, so, why you can convince yourself why about why this is not an Nash equilibrium, why my uh, pulling along minus 5 pi by 4, 5 by 4 is not an Nash equilibrium. So, if player say suppose player 1 pulls along minus 5 pi by 4, ok, thinking that that is that is what would uh, you know is the that is what is the cooper, uh, cooperative solution. So, you if he pulls along that along that direction, player 1 can. So, so, player if player 1 pulls along this direction, player 2 can basically deviate to any direction here. So, he can basically play any direction here and get a better result than get what he gets by playing minus pi pi by 4. So, minus 5 pi by 4 comma minus 5 pi by 4 is not sustainable in a non-cooperative setting because in the absence of communication each player has an incentive to deviate from this, right. So, player if player 1 sticks to this, player 2 would 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 lean more towards the vertical axis downwards. Likewise, if player 2 sticks to this, player 1 would lean more towards the horizontal axis and then eventually as a result, it is better for player 1 to go in this direction and player 2 to go in this direction, ok. So, uh, the reason I brought this example up is because this helps you sort of visualize what is going on in a strategic situation. Essentially, incentives are such that and the, uh, the payoff functions or utilities are such that they are pulling players in various directions. You know, there is a certain direction probably wherein they are all better off, but that is not sustainable or not tenable under the communication constraints that we have, right. The communication constraints require that the players uh, without communicating with each other, they have to make their decisions. So, as a result, only the uh, incentive, the unilateral incentives at play matter 
and in that case what the players would play is actually are along these two axes all right so this is uh, one more example of uh, of a game and again how about how the how cooperation versus uh, competition as a pay, as a trade off plays off uh, plays out in uh, in game theory so let me end with a few other remarks about the nash equilibrium as a concept okay so remember the nash equilibrium is just a concept it was something that nash proposed as a way of solving games uh, now the reason it has such an important status uh, in game theory is because of the context uh, of the times and the 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 direction that the field took up after he introduced the con uh, concept basically he brought clarity to the issue of communication in games which was not clear at that time he also uh, um, uh, clarified a whole bunch of other other uh, you know ideas that were sort of seen as axioms uh, uh, back then you know in the, in the theory of any kind of multi agent decision making including economics and so on now because this is only a concept it is not possible to actually derive the nash equilibrium okay in general at least i will show you some cases where it can be but it is not possible actually to derive the nash equilibrium as a concept you can of course compute a nash equilibrium and derive that a particular point is a nash equilibrium but you cannot derive the definition of a nash equilibrium from uh, from any first principle okay so uh, consequently we can only try and justify the nash equilibrium as something that we can uh, we uh, as something that we find reasonable reasonable uh, sorry no derive means that you know from a for starting from a certain set of assumptions can i derive that the only point that must satisfy all of this is what nash defined as the nash equilibrium so all uh, so certain set of assumptions so what should be those set of assumptions and so on is itself a question okay and that needs uh, deliberation that needs uh, some in some cases it can be done as i will show you but in general this cannot be done all right uh, what you can do is you can try and justify it so after having posed the concept you can expose trying to justify uh, what you know give a post hoc uh, justification for why it makes sense all right so you can justify it for instance one of the main uh, justifications is as i said and it is if you want to call anything an outcome it has to be a nash equilibrium under because otherwise it is under the communication constraints there is an incentive for players to deviate and if the players deviate then uh, it is not an outcome anymore right so that is one the other is uh, is this uh, this idea that you can think of the nash equilibrium as something where if players are dropped at that point then from there there can be for, there is no further need for movement all right so it is so if you were if somehow you were able to suggest them to play this they would agree to that suggestion because assuming the every assuming the other player also agrees so uh, so under the communication constraints if players are dropped at this particular point where they are, they are both been suggested to play this strategy and the other also sticks to that suggestion then you would also not want to do it so this is also another way to uh, to justify the nash equilibrium the nash equilibrium is also somehow it's it's remarkable that it is also seen in nature there are a good number of examples in biology and you know particularly to adaptation and so on where a version of the nash equilibrium basically is can be seen as playing out okay, so that is uh, that could be one more reason why we we find it uh, you know uh, attractive to think about the nash equilibrium so any questions yeah okay so the both the games or all three games actually that i've talked about the prisoner's dilemma the the deer rabbit game and and this one all three of them have this pro property that there was a nash equilibrium the the hunter rabbit game had two nash equilibria right and uh, uh, we have not yet seen a game in which there is no nash equilibrium okay but but you can construct games where there are there is no nash equilibrium all right so the uh, now it's all well and good to give a concept but what if there is no point that satisfies that concept then how do you even apply that concept becomes a question right so this is this is actually a valid question but you will soon see that 
the reason there is no Nash, there, there are games where there, are, there is no Nash equilibrium is because we have not uh, adequately exploited the strategic alternatives available to players. Here, right now, the way we have defined the strategies for the players is that players are required to play either this action or that action and so on, right. If you, uh, it, it turns out that it is possible to generalize this in which you allow players to not just play a particular action, but play a, an action randomly and to randomize over their choices of actions. Once you allow this randomization, it turns out a Nash equilibrium always exists. And this was one of, uh, one of the main, um, uh, main points in his paper that not only is this concept meaningful, there is always a point that satisfies such a con this concept, ok. So, we will come to that in, uh, later in the course. Right now, what I want to do is I want to show you an instance uh, of when, uh, how a Nash equilibrium can actually be derived, right. So, and this sort of takes us back to what uh, one of the things that came up in the prisoner's dilemma. So, if you recall in the prisoner's dilemma, the, the situation was that you had, we had these, this sort of a matrix, right, for the prisoner's dilemma, we had So, there were two choices for the players, silent testify. This was prisoner's dilemma. Now, one of this, when I asked you about how you would solve this, uh, solve this game, one of the observations that um, one of you made was that if you look at the strategy testify for any player, then it has the property that it is better for that player regardless of what the other player plays. So, for example, let us take for player A. So, for player A, testifying is always better than staying silent irrespective of what the other player plays. So, because 0 is less than 1 and 2 is less than 3, all right. Now, and likewise same for player 2 and hence as a result, you could say that therefore, you know, irrespective of the strategic considerations that play, I, it is logical for me to, uh, for a player to play testify and therefore, both players would play testify. Now, this is one way by which you can solve for, uh, you can, you can solve for the game without even invoking the Nash equilibrium, right. You do not need the Nash equilibrium concept to, uh, to reason about this because the numbers are such that, you know, that is, that is what they, the whole, uh, this works out, the, the, uh, this particular logic works out perfectly. So, what we will talk about today is a little bit more general, uh, more general version of this that goes into uh, the concept of what is called dominance. Now, there is, there are two goals of about in this. One is that I will of course teach you about what dominance is and how you actually use uh, dominance in, in solving for games. The other is that you will also see why uh, being careful about the assumptions of a game is really matters okay? and you will see that there are pitfalls uh, if you do not make the right assumptions. So, let us take this, I will write out a game now. So, let us take this game with two players. So, this is player 1. Player 1 has 3 uh, choices which is up, middle and down and player 2 has 3 choices left, middle and right. This is for player 2. I will write out the payoffs here for the players. So, this is 4 comma 3, 5 comma 1, 6 comma 2, 2 comma 1. 
3 comma 6 3 comma 0 9 comma 6 and 2 comma 8 okay and both players are uh, we will make the assumption here that uh, this both players are maximizing okay both players are maximizing the number in so each player is basically interested in the maximum uh, number in its own uh, along its own uh, along its own axis okay now we want to analyze this particular game so we need to start off with a few assumptions so what did i tell you about the assumptions of the prisoner's dilemma what have we what have we assumed about the prisoner's dilemma yeah so we assume that players cannot communicate with each other so that was one assumption what did we assume about the payoffs this matrix yeah so of course players were looking for the smallest number yes but what what did they know about this matrix sorry it stays static but, but more uh, apart from that essentially it was known to them both players knew that this is the game that they are that they are playing right so if you remember the narration that i had I said that these players are held in solitary confinement and then there is a judge that announce, gives them, tells them these options so essentially he is telling them that this is the matrix that that they are looking at okay we will make the same assumption about this particular matrix okay we that both players are are aware of this we also are implicitly are assuming that players are are interested in the maximum payoff for themselves or, or in this be here since this was years in jail they are implicitly we have assumed that players are interested in the least number of years in jail in this in this case each player is interested in the largest number for themselves okay now this is this assumption is what is called the assumption of rationality now rationality basically means that rationality refers to the, uh, is essentially saying that given given a set of choices So, rationality means basically given a set of choices, a player chooses the one with the highest payoff. Okay, it seems very uh, reasonable and logical that essentially what we are assuming here is that players are rational. Okay, that means given whatever be the choices that they have, they would pick, they would not pick, pick something that is uh, that is that gives them a lower payoff than something else. Okay, so, uh, they would pick the one with that with the highest payoff. If there are multiple of the ones with the highest payoff, they could pick any one of those, but they will not pick anything that has giving them a payoff that is strictly lower than the highest. Right? This is the assumption. So now, from this assumption, let us see if we can derive derive that the players will actually play the Nash equilibrium. Okay. So let's we'll come to the Nash equilibrium. Uh, what the Nash equilibrium is, but let us see where this assumption actually takes us. Okay. So we have this. This is uh, we have this situation that players are now exposed to this matrix. They are, and we know that the players, the player, uh, what we know as observers of the game, is that the player is that the players are rational. Okay. So now let's see what can you say about this. Yeah. So if you look at for if you look at player two. And the strategy R for player 2, strategy R is always better than strategy M for player 2, right. So, what is, how do you conclude that? Well, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the payoffs for player 2 are written in the, are the second coordinate here. So, 
2 is better than 1, 6 is better than 4 and 8 is better than 6, right. So, R is better than M regardless of what player, player 1 does, ok. So, consequently from player 2's point of view, player 2 is rational. So, we know we can play from player 2's point of view, player, player 2 will never play M, ok. And as observers of the game, we can also conclude that player 2 will never play M, ok. So, let me mark that out then. I am going to remove this. Okay. So, player 2 is not going to play M. So, M is gone from the picture. The matrix that player 2 is looking at is this matrix formed from just these. Since player 2 is never uh, is not going to play M, what player 2 can see is basically effectively for him the problem is now bit choose about choosing between L and R, ok. So, I have eliminated M for player 2, alright. This is the matrix that player 2 is looking at. Is this the matrix that player 1 is looking at or is player 1 still looking at this matrix? So, we just said that players are rational. We did not say the players know that the, that the other player is rational. Each player knows that he the player himself is rational. It is quite a different thing to say that I also that the player also knows that the other one is rational. ok. So, if I assume ok, if I assume now assuming that player 1 knows that player 2 is rational. Then player 1 can also eliminate M from player 2's strategies. See, so this made the, the matrix here came about by eliminating M for player 2, but it was player 2 who could eliminate it because he he knows he is rational, he is rational, he can eliminate it, ok. So, player 2 eliminates M eliminates M because player 2 is rational. Now, if you assume also that player 1 knows that player 2 is rational, then player 1 is also looking at this at this particular matrix now, ok. Now, what? Yes, right. So, now if you look at this, if you, if you look at this uh, matrix now, player 1 is now looking at this 3 by 2 matrix, the one, uh, the 3 by 2 matrix that I have here, right. If I assume that player 2 knows that player, uh, sorry, player 1 is uh, knows that player 2 is rational, then player 1, player 1 is also looking at this particular matrix. And in this matrix, now u is better than both m and d for player 1. So, player 1 can therefore now eliminate m and d, ok. So, uh, we can just verify this if you want. So, see 4 is better than 2 and 3. 6 is better than 3 and 2, ok. So, I can eliminate both M and D, ok. So, now player 2 eliminated this and he is now looking at this just this matrix with so player so, player 1 is now uh, has eliminated this and player 1 is now looking at this matrix. Now, which matrix is player 2 looking at? Hmm. P2 knows that P1 is rational, ok. Is that enough? P1 
one knows that P2 is rational, yes, that we have already assumed. Exactly. Exactly. So, just like we assumed here that P1 knows that P2 is rational, we can symmetrically assume that P2 knows that P1 is rational, but that is not enough. You also need that P2 knows that P1 knows that P2 is rational, right. So, if you assume, assuming again assuming that that P2 knows that P1 knows that P2 is rational. Then P2 can also eliminate both M and D, M comma D from P1 strategy. Okay. So, in fact, I will just make this more general instead of saying that uh, uh, instead of saying P1 knows and so on, let, let me just write it that each player knows. Each player knows that okay, each player knows that each player is rational, and then each player knows that each player knows that each player is rational. Okay. So is it ever useful to have a non rational player? Yeah. Also, I mean I can I can come to that as well. Each player knows that each player knows that each player is rational. Okay, we will come to non rationality in a, uh, in a moment. So, uh, now assuming this, I have now been able to eliminate eliminate M and D not just from player 1's uh, view, but also from player 2's view. So, uh, hence, if as an observer of the game, if I have if I know all of this about the players. I can now conclude safely conclude that both players are now looking at this reduced matrix here. Okay. Now here again, I can uh, here of course there's just one strategy for uh, uh, one strategy for for uh, for player one. Now you can from here it's rather trivial. There is nothing left for player one to choose, so he is obviously going to play uh, play you. Okay. And then from and you know you can use whatever argument you want. You can put one more level of uh, of uh, assumption like this if you want for player two, or you can just simply argue that well, this is basically not a game anymore. It's trivial because there's just one uh, one choice for player two, and therefore player one, and therefore player two will obviously play play, uh, play R. Okay. So the point is that. This is one way by which you can go about solving a game from first principles without you know creating a concept ok. This is and what do we mean by solving from first principles? We need to put in assumptions about what players know and what players do and then from that like a almost like a puzzle go about reasoning what is exactly going to be uh, what exactly is going to be the outcome of such a game. Right? And that leads you to this outcome of uh, uh, outcome u comma r. Now this is this this way of solving is what is called the elimination of dominated strategies. So I'll just make this more precise. 